Hello. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, first, if you are on the CCM events Wi-Fi, please uh, disconnect from it. That's what we're using to live stream the event. So it would be very sad if it's bogged down. Um, you want to use CCM guest. Um, the password is CCM sharing. The other is, um, obviously, you're not doing it now, but <laughs> please don't sit on the stairs uh, if you come back for other sessions or if people come in and sit on the stairs during the session, please just kind of try and bring them in. Um, so our next guest is a staff researcher at VMware. Uh, she previously was a user experience researcher at the Macintosh Business Unit at Microsoft. She worked on all kinds of awesome things like uh, Outlook and um, the OneNote for iPhone and iPad apps. Pretty cool. <laughs> Nadine Richmond. I'm Mike. You know, it's hard being a user researcher in a room full of Apple developers, even if you're a long-time Apple developer like myself. Because when people, when you say that you work in user experience, people assume design. And when you say, no, 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 I'm a researcher, the response is, what? Because when we think about great Apple products, we think about its great design. We don't necessarily think about the research that went into it. In fact, research has a pretty bad name in some circles. And that's because it's really easy to do bad research. For example, sometimes when we think of user research, we think of focus groups. Now, Steve Jobs said this right after he returned to Apple in an interview with Business Week. This is a great quote because, think about it, a focus group is 10 people around a, co a conference table. If you spent, take 10 people, put them around a conference table for an hour or two, what comes out of that is not creativity, is not an awesome product. It's some ideas maybe, but what falls out of that is not a great product. And trying to get a great product out of a focus group is not the right way to do user research. User research also isn't transcription. I love this quote. I love this quote for two reasons. It exemplifies two major pitfalls of bad user research. The first is that you can't just go up and say, excuse me, what would be an awesome product? And write it down. And then go to the next person and say, excuse me, what would be an awesome product? And keep on repeating that, I don't know, 10 people or so. And then go back to your office and say, hmm, five people said that this would be awesome. And four people said that this would be awesome. And one person, they said that this would be awesome. That's not user research. That's just transcription. The second thing that this quote exemplifies about bad user research is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is something we do as humans. We believe things, of course. And when we believe something, we tend to notice and remember something that, that confirms what we already believe. Even worse as humans, when we, ha when we see something ambiguous, we interpret it as confirming what we already believe. This Henry Ford quote, it's apocryphal. There's no evidence that Henry Ford actually said this. If you call the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, they get called about this all the time, there's no evidence that Henry Ford actually said this. But this quote from Steve Jobs' autobiography is one of, like, of over 20 that I found in just a quick search, trying to figure out when he first said it. I can't actually figure out when he first said it. But think about it. Henry Ford is generally agreed to be one of the greatest inventors of the 20th century. Wouldn't it be awesome? If he had actually said this, if he had recognized that you can't just go up to someone and say, so what would be great, and get a great answer? We want this quote to be true. We repeat this quote over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many times I ran across this quote. But it's not true. We want it to be true, and it's not. And so avoiding that is something we have to do in user research. I'm going to trip over this thing, I'm sorry to say. So, if user research isn't about transcription, and it's not about focus groups, and we know we have to avoid confirmation bias, what is user research? When I was trying to answer this question for this audience, I decided to, that we should go a little back in time. 
How many of you were there at Moscone with me in uh, January 2007 when the iPhone was first introduced? I knew I wasn't the only geek there. What I thought was awesome about the launch of the iPhone was that it's a truly, it was, in my opinion, a truly revolutionary product, and the launch of it exemplified so many of the basic tenets of awesome user research. I'm going to walk through those today. User research is about observation. You have to get out of your office, if you're like me and work for a big corporate overload, or out of your living room, if you're an indie developer, or out of your focus group facility, if you run one of those, and go out and look at people doing real things on their own without you prompting them. From the intro to the iPhone, we, said, we heard this. It's really hard to make a call on the phones at the time. Remember, I don't know about you guys, I had an, uh, one of those Motorola Razor flip phones. I thought it was great. And that's the thing, is that if you had asked me at the time about my Motorola flip phone, I would have said, yeah, pretty cool, I'm happy with it. If you had asked a leading question like, so do you have problems making calls on it? I would have said no. Why, was it, why is that? Because my flip phone was a step up from my landline at home, which I'd had forever. At least on my flip phone, I had caller ID. I had a recent history list. I had a horrible little address book with like four phone numbers in it that were the calls that I most commonly made. But this was this huge step up from my landline. But look back at this observation. It actually took a couple of minutes every time you wanted to make a call on something that is ostensibly called a cell phone. That's a great observation, and that is at the core of user research. User research is also about analysis. It's not just enough to go out and observe people. You have to think about what you learned. Now remember, way back in the dark ages of 2007, if you said smartphone, what you probably actually meant was BlackBerry. BlackBerry was the smartphone of the time. This is the BlackBerry Curve, which is the best BlackBerry of 2007. And people loved it. Remi I know it's hard to believe now. But at the time, BlackBerry users thought that the BlackBerry was the most awesome thing ever. Remember? People called it the Crackberry. Now let's go back to the, uh, to the introduction of the uh, iPhone. These are two pieces of analysis about the BlackBerry and about other smartphones at the time, all of which had hard keyboards. Now this is awesome analysis. You've got this huge form factor in your hand, which is taken up most of the, uh, a fair amount of space is taken up by a keyboard, which you're not using most of the time. And when you are actually using it, it's error prone. Now, of course, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, about the iPhone itself that introduces its own problems. But this is awesome analysis of where the state of the art was at the time and what we need to do. Now, we're a group of developers, so we all know the dirty secret of software development, which is that there is no project since Hello World that has shipped on our original schedule with the same number of features that we originally planned. It just hasn't happened. And so there comes a time when you're in the middle of your development project and you're stuck in the mud and you either have to cut features or slip your schedule or both. And you have to go back and remember what it is that actually matters. Go back to your observation, go back to your analysis and figure out what it is that you need to focus on. So let's go back to the keyboard. This is Steve Jobs talking about the keyboard during the iPhone launch. It's phenomenal. It does error prevention. It does correction. Now, of course, that spawned, damn you, autocorrect. That's a separate problem. And it's faster than, keyboard, than the hard keyboards of the time. The problem is getting to that awesome soft keyboard was really difficult. This is from a New York Times write-up. Of the, uh, of the introduction of the iPhone. 
the keyboard got stuck in the mud at one point in the development cycle. And knowing that the keyboard was key, sorry, to the user experience, they stopped everything and worked on the keyboard. It didn't matter if Safari was awesome and blazingly fast. If you couldn't enter a URL, how good is Safari? It didn't matter how great the, uh, the iPhone Apple or the iPhone mail app was if you couldn't actually write an email. So they stopped everything and focused on something that was integral to the user experience across the whole phone and fixed it and maintained their focus on delivering an awesome app or an awesome phone. Great user research. Now pause for a moment and think. So we've got a great keyboard, we've got the screen, we've got everything. What else is it ab about the iPhone that made it awesome? It's about understanding the context that people use things in. It's not just enough to think about my phone, which is actually behind backstage, and it's not enough about to think about the apps that I launch. It's about the whole thing. It's about how the iPhone fits in my pocket and is thus just part of my life. I don't know about you guys, but I remember, uh, this is one of the quotes that I, always, uh, that I always pull out to my team when they're trying to cut my fit and finish features, that we have to carry through the user experience from beginning to end. We have to remember that it's not, that we can't deliver 80%. We have to go all the way and deliver 100%. In thinking about delivering 100%, this is from the patent application for the packaging of the iPhone. They patented the packaging, that piece of cardboard and plastic patented. Why is that? Because it was important to the user experience. It was important to the overall context that our users were using the phone in. Remember unpacking your first iPhone? You, got, you opened it up and there was this satisfying little funk as the two halves separated, and then there's your iPhone, it's just presented there all neatly, it's not buried anywhere, it's not covered in plastic, and you could just pull it out and it was charged, and you could start setting it up immediately. That's awesome user experience. That's about thinking about your users in the whole context, not just about using, your, using the phone or using mail. It's thinking about everything and keeping it all in mind. And that, is why user experience and user research is about remembering that, you're, that users are not users. I actually hate the term users, even though my title is user researcher, I fight against it all the time. User research is about understanding people. It's about not thinking of your users as users. It's about remembering that they're not using your app 24-7. They're not using your product 24-7. It fits into whatever their greater lives are whether it's attending a conference or getting over the last bit of a head cold that's making your voice go in and out. There's a context, and it fits into their lives. This is from the New York Times write-up of the launch of the iPhone. And I put this here, I put this uh, paragraph here, because it makes a great break for me to get a drink of water. Now think back to the launch of the iPhone. It wasn't about the technology. It was about how you as a person had that technology fit into your life. I can't speak for anybody else, but I'm a huge music nerd. I got my, I got my eight gig iPhone and I, on launch day, and I went home and I promptly put seven and a half gigs of music on it. Awesome, because on my big screen, I had my artwork of my album, and that gave me such a huge warm fuzzy. And that's great user experience is understanding that it's not about having a beautiful screen, it's what I see on that beautiful screen. It's how it fits into my life. It's that I pull my phone out of my pocket and I see my artwork and I go, oh, nice, yay. And it's not the keyboard. We can't, you can't just talk about the keyboard and say, oh yeah, faster, blah, blah, blah. How does the keyboard fit into my life? You might remember that the way they introduced it was texting. Steve texted Phil Schiller and said, let's meet up for dinner at Sushi Den. It's about how your, how your app fits into your user's life. And talk about the keyboard, talk about what you do with it and why it matters. 
And then, of course, everybody remembers the, uh, the Maps integration and a prank calling that poor Starbucks uh, asking for 4,000 lattes. That Starbucks, by the way, reports that they still get that prank call to this day. But it wasn't about making a prank call. It was about never getting lost. It was about always being able to get around. It was about understanding what having a device in your pocket all the time, which conveniently has GPS and mobile data uh, in, fits into your life and how you can use it and how you can make that an awesome thing. What I love, by the way, but I, did, I didn't put this in this slide, is that the title of this uh, article from the Times is, Then Steve Said, Let There Be an iPhone, which I found it pretty entertaining. The most important thing about user research is that it all comes together. It comes to your, you did your observation, you did your analysis, you maintained your focus on what was really important, remembered the context. User research is about identifying the future. This is from Steve Jobs' autobiography, or biography, excuse me. Our task is to read things that are not yet on the page. That's what great user research does. You observe people, understand, understand those little points of friction that people have that they couldn't even articulate or notice, like it taking three minutes to make a phone call to my best friend. It's about under, doing the analysis to see what works today and what doesn't, and maintaining that focus to deliver an awesome product and deliver what gets written on the page in the future. That is awesome user research. That leads to awesome products, and that's what I'm hoping you will do. Thank you. Which means I have time for questions. Looks like I've got eight minutes for questions, so let's run. This is great because I've been always trying to tell people I work with that user research is all about observation. Yes. Uh, but mostly people tend to believe in focus groups. Yep. And that's so sad because uh, people always lie in focus groups. They, they give you the answers you want to hear or they want to please you. And I usually put just a video camera in the room and just see what they do. So thank you for that. And if you could share something about how to intelligently use focus groups. Sure. Um, the biggest problem with focus groups is that is there anybody in here who works in marketing? Okay, I'm really sorry. I'm going to say something very offensive to you, and I'm very sorry right now. Focus groups are often run by marketing teams. And marketing wants to hear that, yes, what we're about to deliver is awesome. And marketing wants an awesome quote about how great our product is. And so a focus group, you sit around your t you send ten, send t sit 10 people around a conference table, and you say, so I'm going to show you this thing, and isn't it awesome? Like, was this not the best talk you have ever seen? And you, being human, go, yeah, actually, it was pretty cool. Even though inside you're going, oh my god, that was really horrible. One of the problems of focus group is, adding, is asking leading questions. You, um, I work with a designer. He's a great designer. I adore him. And he's really great at designing and coming up with different ideas. One thing that I cannot do with this designer is I can't let him in front of an audience because he's so enthusiastic. He's one of the most positive people I have ever met. I wish I could bottle him. But the problem is, when he's presenting a design or talking to one of our users, even though he doesn't mean it, and even though he's not asking a leading question, he's so enthusiastic, it's infectious. And so people go and, and say, yeah, that was great. That's awesome. It totally meets my needs. And so one of the things that you have to avoid in a focus group is being too enthusiastic. You have to be a lot more neutral. A great thing to do, use a focus group for is to understand what works and doesn't work today. It's a great way to do it. You, it's a great way to validate things you think you already know and maybe pick up some information that you hadn't heard before. Another good way to run a focus group is if you get a group of people who work together, like if that's important to your application, getting them together to talk about how they work together and what they do and why they do it is a great use of a focus group because they can bounce ideas off of each other, you know, and you can say, well, you know, I email you and you never respond, and I can go, oh, right, that's because you forgot the attachment. 
And so we can bounce back and forth and identify what the underlying problem is. And having a conversation like that is really good. It requires great moderation skills on the person who's running the focus group. And that's really the intent. Is, uh, that's one of the core things is if you don't get the person who's moderating the focus group to really do a great job, you're going to end up with a bunch of people saying, yeah, that was awesome. And you'll have fed them sandwiches and paid them 100 bucks, and that's the end of it. Yes. <clears throat> so this is probably in, a, uh, in another talk altogether. But uh, you sold me on what user research is. You've told me what not to do. Yes. What, what do I do? What observation skills do you have? What, what do you look for? What, what, what shorthand do you have to start getting into the observation? My short, so one of my favorite things to do, like if I don't know what I'm, what I'm going to do, what, what my research is going to be, like I'm really just starting off at the very beginning. I have, I, I have actually done this. I've gone to a coffee shop. I've set up a little tent card that says, tell me about something. Uh, for example, when I was at Microsoft, I did some research about what makes Mac users tick. So I put a little tent card up in a coffee shop saying, tell me about your Mac. And I sat, uh, and, oh, and I think I wrote on it, and I'll buy you a coffee. I had a line of people waiting to tell me about their Mac. I spent five minutes with each of them saying, tell me about your Mac. And it was awesome because it, I learned so much. You learn a lot about, about something by just hearing what's top of mind to them. Because what I was interested in is we had a theory that Mac users are more attached to their Macs than other users, and which we validated, by the way. But anyway, um, I know exactly. Um, that, that's actually one of the fun. That was, <laughs> that was a great quote, actually. Um, I, was in a, uh, I was interviewing somebody who was talking about a coffee shop. He said that um, you know, he was sitting there, and someone seated, seated across from him said, um, I need to run to the restroom. Could you watch my laptop? And he said, sure. And so the person went to the, uh, went to the bathroom. And while they were in the bathroom, someone else actually tried to steal their laptop. And the guy said, hang on, no. That's mine. You can't take it. And the person ran away without the laptop. And he recounted this story to me. And then he looks at me and he says, I don't know if I would have done that if it were Adele. <laughs> so, open, so start open-ended. And if you don't know what a follow on, what a good follow on question is, this is uh, I'm giving away all the biggest trick of my trade right now. Tell me more, because that gets you. So like if you don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> you don't know how to phrase a great question that won't be leading, or that won't sound idiotic because you don't know what they're talking about. Tell me more it gets you so far. And if you keep on repeating that, you'll pick up enough eventually to be able to ask a more intelligent follow on question. Think I've got time for one more? Yes, ish. <laughs> so um, his question was uh, whether I worked on Office for iPad and whether I did any user testing on that. Um, so I did. That was at the very end of my tenure at Microsoft. Um, one of the things that I did was that Three weeks after the launch of the iPad, I was out in the field doing research with early iPad adopters to understand what it was. Why did they buy an iPad? What is it that they were trying to accomplish with an iPad? What were they already doing with it? And where did they see their iPad going in the future? So I mean, you know, I mean this was very early research. And this was part of the decision-making process of, should we bring Office to the iPad? And clearly, the ultimate answer from Microsoft was yes, since we saw it released a few weeks ago. So that was. That was about trying to understand from very early adopters, recognizing that this is a self-selected user base, which isn't necessarily representative, but still getting out there and understanding where the trend is and seeing if that trend continues on. And then I left Microsoft. It is 11.30, so I believe it's time for me to hand off to the next person. We'll just take a quick break, and then we'll have our next speaker. For example, sometimes when we think of user research, we think of focus groups. Now, Steve Jobs said this right after he returned to Apple in an interview with Business Week. This is a great quote, because think about it. A focus group is 10 people around a, co a conference table. If you spent, take 10 people, put them around a conference table for an hour or two, 
What comes out of that is not creativity, is not an awesome product. It's some ideas, maybe, but what falls out of that is not a great full of Apple developers, even if you're a long-time Apple developer like myself. Because when people, when you say that you work in user experience, people assume design. And when you say, no, 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 I'm a researcher, the response is, what? Because when we think about great Apple products, we think about its great design. We don't necessarily think about the research that went into it. In fact, research has a pretty bad name in some circles. And that's because it's really easy to do bad research. Hello. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, first, if you are on the CCM events Wi-Fi, please uh, disconnect from it. That's what we're using to live stream the event. So it would be very sad if it's bogged down. Um, you want to use CCM guest. Um, the password is CCM sharing. The other is. Um, Obviously, you're not doing it now, but <laughs> please don't sit on the stairs uh, if you come back for other sessions or if people come in and sit on the stairs during the session, please just kind of try and bring them in. Um, so our next guest is a staff researcher at VMware. Uh, she previously was a user experience researcher at the Macintosh Business Unit at Microsoft. She worked on all kinds of awesome things like uh, Outlook and um, the OneNote for iPhone and iPad apps. Pretty cool. <laughs> Nadine Richmond. I'm Mike. You know, it's hard being a user researcher in a room.